Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Outside Insider Podcast here on Philly Sports Network with myself, Liam Jenkins. You know the score by now. All things Eagles related, the last seven days, wrapped up and stuffed inside your Christmas turkey. I hope you all had a lovely Christmas. Happy Christmas and a Merry New Year. Switch it round, shake things up, have some fun. Um, To every single one of you, I think... I think this is the last podcast of 2019, which is a little bit emotional. So there will be a big soppy speech at the end, all right? We're not going to start with it because you'll be going, oh, God, he's off again. And we won't get to the Good Eagles stuff. And there is a little bit of Good Eagles stuff, all right? But I hope you had an amazing Christmas. I mean, one of my favorite gifts I got was a Carson Wentz pop figure. So that's going straight in the office. Um, but if someone who knows anything about pop figures could let me know what to do with it, that would be good. Because I don't know whether you take it out the box, whether you leave it in the box. Like my little brother collects them and he's got some box, some unbox. There seems to be a bit of, you know, kerfuffle as to how to treat pop figures. But either way, Carson Wentz is going to be in the office, not literally. Um, and, and I'll get him out next podcast. First one of 2020. Alright, we've all come a long way in 2019. Um, but if you are new to this show and you're wondering why is a British kid telling me Happy Christmas, I've never met him in my life and what does he know about the Eagles, yeah? You, you're very right to ask those questions. But if you could subscribe, we're on iTunes, no, it's called Apple Podcasts now, they're shaking it up. Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, all of them, right? Just go and subscribe. Um, if you could leave a rating on Apple Podcasts, that would be lovely. If you're on YouTube, hello, I know you've seen the first 10 minutes of this. Um, and I wanted to start this show today. Which is something I really didn't think I'd, I'd start with. Now, on Boxing Day, now the first, hang on, hang on, hang on, first things first. You guys don't celebrate Boxing Day if you're in America, and that re- makes me deeply sad. Like, it is the one of the best days of the year. Like, in my opinion, better than Halloween. It's up there, like, just below Christmas Day, alright? Day after Christmas Day, um, it's a little bit lighter, so it's like Christmas Day without the presents, alright? So you get friends over, because obviously you see your family's Christmas Day, friends on Boxing Day, football all day long, all the beer, big fat quiz of the year, you go out, it's a jolly good time, alright? It's the best day. So next year, just celebrate Boxing Day with me, you have a whale of a time, I promise. Um, but a little light bulb went off when I was writing an article because, you know, me, work, we can't really get apart, really. It's, it's, it's almost like work is the analogy I've used for the last year about, you know, when I'm saying about a girl or a relationship, it's actually just Philly Sports Network and I'm so besotted with it. Um, but, but this is something I thought about. I was writing an article and something blew up in me head and I was thinking, wow, that's mad. And I think as, as sports fans or, or fans of anything, we have a habit where if something is particularly bad for a long stretch of time, that when things start to change, however minimal or mad that may be, we don't give it the credit because we're like, still bad, <laughs> still sucks, yeah, still, still awful, isn't it? Still, still bad. So something hit me with regards to the Eagles where I think that we've been criticising something for so, so long this year, and even back to last year, that now things have started to change we're not giving the credit in the same way we would if it was criticism. Like, if this man messed up again and made another mistake, it would be World War Three. there will be riots and pitchforks, and it will be a dreadful scene. But if he does something good, people just go on about their day, don't really care, pick up a, a cheesesteak and eat it and say, hey, this is a good cheesesteak, don't really care, he's bad. And it remind- I'm not going to, you know, spoil it just yet. I'll give you an analogy, and you can try and work out what we're talking about here. Um, back when I worked at a retail store, so I think it would have been last Christmas, I gave you my heart, right? Um, family come in, and they're like, hey, LJ, I can see you, don't call me LJ, he's like, I can see you're a sophisticated young man, I want to buy an iMac from you. And I was like, excellent, right, that's, that's the type of guy we like. So, he buys an iMac for his daughter for university, and he's in a suit, and he's all businessy, and he's like, ah, but, but I need it set up now. And I was like, right, well, listen, Gary, this is where I've got to break it to you, like sea ice. And we've got a bit of a problem uh, where basically the setup table is very busy, guy. Very busy, okay. Very busy. It's it's like the last Saturday before Christmas. Everyone's hustling and bustling around. They all want their phones set up. We can't fit a big slappy Mac on the table and get it set up for you, gas lads. So what are we gonna do? And he was like, "Well, this is despicable. This is disgusting." And at this point, I was already sick, okay. Um, I was on like two hours sleep. So for those of you who don't know, the big sop like um, this old retail job, I. It worked an hour away, so I'd be up at 6am, I'd get home at 8pm, I'd work on PSN until like 2 in the morning, I would pass out, we'd do it all over again. Do it all over again, baby, and I was gone. I had bags from my eyes down to my lips, I was spewing my guts up, um, and I was like, hey, I'll, I'll try to see what I can do, alright, I'll get to talk to the manager. So, I go over, and I'm like, hey, Paul, right, anyway, we can set this up for this guy, alright, he's a bit impatient, he's a little bit upset, 
uh, his daughter's going to university, they need it set up now. And Paul was like, listen, Liam, what does that say? It's a table full. So he left it. And I went back to him, tried to break the bad news. He did not take that well. Went down like a cup of cold six. So I was like, listen, Gaz, I'll do it for you. I feel you. You're a busy man. You're in a hurry. I'm in a hurry all my life. All right, let me. I was like, come with me. I'll sort you out. So we're sitting down at this table. I rock it through the setup. Get it all perfect. And off he goes, skipping out the shop, happy as Gary, right? Perfect day. I was like, I've done my job well. I got a bollock in from the manager because I did the opposite of what he said, but that's not the point. I thought, you know what? He's going to leave a lovely review. When he gets sent that survey about asking his customer service, he's going to leave the loveliest review imaginable because through all of the the spewing my guts up, through all of the not having room and all the obstacles in the way, I went above and beyond to make life a little bit better for him. Didn't have to. Didn't have to do it. All right. Didn't have to. But I did it anyway, because I'm a nice... Went, went over my shift, all right? I'll stay till 4.30. I, I'm the dumb, dumb out of Gary. All right, I did it for you. Did it for you. At least you can do. Rate five stars, yeah? He didn't. Um, he left a one star. I knew it was, I knew it was him, because the, the exact response he left was something along the lines of, uh, this was disgustingly poor customer service, because he was coughing his guts up all over me. Uh, I've now got a cold for Christmas. My daughter is ill. This isn't acceptable. He shouldn't have been sent home because he was sick. Gary, if you're watching this, you're a knobhead, first and foremost. Secondly, all right, who does that remind you of? Uh, all right, me, me, go, uh, uh, I mean, the, the customer. It's Mike Grow, ladies and gentlemen. It is Mike Grow. Because over the last month, this Eagles offense should have been so dead in the, deader than it already was. It was already dead in the water. It should have started sinking now, like, like a, a rock. Really, down to the bottom of the ocean where it was beyond repair and, I don't know, some astronomer, because they study space, some deep sea diver will find it, you know, down the line and go, wow, what was this ancient rock? It's the eagle's offense, look at that, it was awful, right? Um, it's not happening. Somehow, an eagle's offense, without any of their starting receivers, without their starting running back, without their starting right tackle, has gone on to be really, really good. Now, you can make the argument, hey, Liam. They're playing silly opponents, all right? The Dolphins, the Redskins, the Giants, a dysfunctional Cowboys team. And I say, hey, any given Sunday, all right? Which means any Sunday, given. So, there's that. Um, just for context, okay? Here's a snippet from said article. Go read it if you want. Um, over the last three weeks, the Eagles have now become a top 10 rushing offense, averaging 131 yards a game. What's really outstanding, however, is that in the sign... Yeah, I said sign. In the same time frame, they rank second in first downs, meaning they're keeping drives alive longer and sustaining progress, right? Their average for the year is 21.3. For context, it's now up to around 25. They also rank first in completions during that span. C-dub, getting it done. But even that can be traced back to a change. Because somewhere along the line, you may have noticed this, the Eagles offense just started spinning a little bit, didn't it? And I mean that literally and metaphorically, because out of nowhere, out of the blue, Carson Wentz was doing design rollouts literally every other play. Some went good, some went bad, some were alright, but they were there. Sprint outs, rollouts, play action, it was just a change. And the, the reason was that Carson Wentz, standing in the pocket for so long, being marginalised as a pocket quarterback, where his pocket awareness still isn't great, Okay, we can all acknowledge that. He's an exceptional quarterback, a borderline elite talent with low-level pocket awareness. All right, escapability and going, oh, God, get away. That's amazing. That's unparalleled. But in terms of, oh, there's pressure, whoop, that's, that needs a bit of work, Carson Sunshine. But instead of forcing him to lose that escapability skill set, they were like, why don't you just escape from the snap? Just start rolling out, rolling out, rolling out. So he did. And the beauty of that is, A, he's outside the pocket where he's comfortable. B, there's no pressure. And C, you're constantly trying to give it to the running back, right? It's play action look. So you're selling the run. You can build the run game based off the passing game. You run to pass, you pass to run. Everyone's happy. Miles Sanders, in the meantime, has absolutely blown up. Uh, let's just get his numbers up for context. Over the last four games, he has 79 carries, 329 yards, 4.6 yards per carry, 20 receptions for 173 yards, and 6 total touchdowns. Why? Well, all of a sudden, he's not lining up in the shotgun anymore. He's lining up way back there, baby. Single back formation. Get in the back of the bus, Miles. Off we go. That's where Miles is. He's at the back of the bus. I'm driving it, right? And uh, what we're seeing from Miles Sanders now is that naturally, if you're a slow decision maker, and you're a bit, you know... Someone comes up to you at a dinner table and they're like, hey, uh, are you ready to order? And I'm like, 
Mark, no, I'm not Mark, okay? I'm looking, I'm bad. You, you said I'm ready to order, it's only making it worse. All right, I don't know. Do I want the scallop? Do I want cheese on toast? I don't know. Give me some time. And I, I can't make it out. If he says, I'll come back in 10 minutes, I'm relaxed. I can breeze through the menu. I can find the starter I want. I can look at everything until I ultimately know I'm going to get the same thing I always get. But the point remains. You're given more time, which means the game will slow down for you. Miles Sanders, instead of being shotgun going, ah, and straightforward, he's now way back there, aren't you, Miles? Right? So now, by the time he gets the ball, there's like five yards between him and the line, meaning he's got longer to process the holes in front of him and can move adequately. Which, naturally, if you can make decisions at a slower pace, you can begin making them at a faster pace. You see where I'm going with this now? So, as much as play action is helping Carson Wentz and buying time for receivers that can't get separation and helping tight ends get open over the middle, it is also buying time for Miles Sanders. And I'm not being funny. That is way too much offensive change to avoid being credited. Now, it's tricky because ultimately we don't know how much offensive coordinator Mike Gray really plays in this. All we know for sure is that he helps scheme or has a predominant role in the first 15 plays of the game. He scripts those plays. I'm not the only one that's noticed an uptick in first half scoring, am I right? First drive scoring, first quarter scoring. This has all been a a swift uptick. The Eagles getting touchdowns on their first drive, that was almost impossible in week two. I had no idea that was possible. But here we are. And I'm not again sitting here saying, oh, most improved coach of the year. He's a destined head coach one day, baby. He is a good man. But I am saying, if we're going to sit here, as a community of fans, of analysts, as media, as national outlets or whoever, and put this man into the ground game after game, and then ask him the most ridiculous questions because he gives the most ridiculous answers. CC Golden Tate. CC, it's too early to game plan for Jordan Howard or Zach Ertz. Like, bless his, he tries his best. He's not very good with the media, all right? But there has been a significant change, and I don't think that if it's all come from Doug Brilliant, alright? The Eagles have got themselves a once in a lifetime coach there. But I probably assume there's going to be some conversations Mike Rose had an input. And I think it's safe to say that, hey, if we're all going to tear the man down and try and body bag him and get him out of this city and be like, hey, he needs a fresh mind. A fresh mind from outside. No more of this Philadelphia in-house promotion. We're going to go outsourcing. We're going to put a call centre in India. We're going to ring up your home and say, do you need new windows? Because I do. And we're going to win that way. We're not. All right, let's pump the brakes for a second and just say, you don't have to say well done. You don't even have to congratulate Mike Grow on the recent success. All you've got to do is say, fair play, Mike. Fair play. Because what you've done is be criticised for three quarters of the year, been arguably dreadful for three quarters of the year, go out and make such uh, swift adjustments, such intense changes to the foundation of this offence, where now it is literally based on play-action passes and rollouts and screens. And stuff underneath. And uh, really adapting to the lack of playmakers that they have. It deserves credit. And if no one else is going to do it. Then I will. Because I think it has to be done. So Mike. Have yourself a glass of Jack Daniels. Not too much. You've got a game Sunday. All right, I don't want that mind slipping back into old habits. Let's just focus on here and now. But overall. Mike Grow, Well done. And that is the end of the first 10 minutes of this show, which means we get to my favourite part, which is, of course, thank you next. If you want to stick around for that on YouTube, the full show's coming out later. Hello to you. If you're not on YouTube, strap yourselves in. It's time to get thank you next us. <laughs> 